Greetings, friends. Welcome to an edition of Movie That's So Groovy. Movies that put a smile on my face. Gems you may have missed. I'm your host, Alex, and today's feature up for review is... Frankenstein. 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 Frankenstein Conquers the World, starring Nick Adams, Tadeo Takashima, Kumi Mizuno, Yoshio Tsuchiya, and Koji Furuhata as... Frankenstein, directed by Ishiro Honda, 1965. Japanese film director Ishiro Honda had a career spanning over 60 years, and starting in 1951 with his first feature, he went on to direct nearly 50 movies. Best known by American audiences for his kaiju films, kaiju being Japanese for strange beast, he is the man who brought us Godzilla, Rodan, Varin the Unbelievable, Mothra, and many, many other gleefully apocalyptic orgies of destruction that are really kid vid at heart. But of all of his giant monster movies, Frankenstein Conquers the World is one of my favorites, and that's because it's completely, lovably bonkers. In Nazi Germany during the waning days of World War II, a mad scientist packs up the heart of Frankenstein's monster into a steamer trunk for the German military, which has been charged with taking it on a top-secret mission that could win the war for the Axis. The plan is to transport it by Das Boot beneath the Horn of Africa to the Mid-Pacific, played just for this movie by the Indian Ocean. The heart is transferred from the U-boat over to a Japanese submarine. Suddenly, Allied aircraft show up and drop a bunch of bombs on them. Sayonara, off we design. Then the Japanese sub happily steams off with its cargo to Hiroshima. One of the greatest you gotta be kidding me moments in movie history. The heart is delivered to Hiroshima and a surgeon for study. The surgeon, played by the great Japanese character actor Takashi Shimura, the only actor who ever lived who could say, I start in Seven Samurai and Godzilla. But wouldn't you know, the very day the heart of Frankenstein's monster is delivered to Hiroshima, the Enola Gay flies over and drops the A-bomb? What are the odds of that, huh? Fifteen years later, in Hiroshima, it is discovered that a feral boy is living in the hills behind the city and eating stray pets. He murdered our dog, and he took it away with him. I believe he's going to eat it. Soon, Dr. Bowen, Dr. Kawaji, and Dr. Tomagi from the Hiroshima International Institute of Radiotherapeutics are on the case. Here we see Sueko making friends with Frankenstein's monster by tossing him a bag of raw meat. Truly. The quickest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And after a hunt, Bowen and Sueko find Feral Frankenstein Kid and take him back to the Institute. All right. Take it easy now. We're friends. Right now. Meanwhile, at the Akita oil fields, the place blows all to hell. And then the monster Baragon puts in an appearance. Baragon is something of a giant armadillo who can stand on his hind legs if he has to take a leak, and who can bury underground and destroy oil rigs for apparently no reason other than to give Frankenstein somebody to fight. Meanwhile, we learn that Frankenstein's heart was subjected to radiation from the atomic blast, and the boy grew from the heart. Now, 15 years later, all this kid wants to do is eat and grow out of his clothes. The chain hurts you. I'll bet there are fathers all over the world with teenage children sitting there thinking, uh-huh, uh-huh. Now, this being a Japanese monster movie, there is always one character who's a complete screw-up and makes a total mess of everything. And the award goes to Dr. Kawaji, who lets in the TV news crew to film the creature with predictable results. The 
Getting back to Baragon, of all the giant Japanese monsters in all the Japanese monster movies I've ever seen, I like Baragon the best. Mothra, Varin, Rodin. They really didn't have much going for him in the personality department. But Baragon, he does have a personality. He's a snot nosed punk. I mean, when you look at those rolling eyeballs, he's a schemer, all right. Like in this sequence where he raids the chicken farm knowing full well everybody in town is going to blame the big tall dumb guy with the flat head. If you've ever been accused of something you didn't do, I'm sure you can relate. So the last 15 minutes of the movie is the battle royale between Frankenstein, now 60 feet tall, and Baragon, which is the reason why anybody watching this movie would be watching in the first place. Ouch. I'll bet that hurts. The fight has this rambunctious romper room quality to it, which I enjoy. You almost half expect a giant 80-foot mom to step in and say, Okay, boys, break it up. Ishiro Honda was a master of spectacle. Maybe not of plots that made any sense, or of dialogue that wouldn't embarrass a second-rate comic book writer. But if you're hot on seeing things like a gigantic Frankenstein monster terrorizing a bunch of kids on some rock and roll cruise, Honda's your man. With Ashiro at the helm, we get to see the only Frankenstein monster to ever get hit by a cab. Obligatory Japanese monster movie shots of citizens running for their lives, in this case fearing Frankenstein is going to catch them and eat them and Mount Fuji in flames while Frankenstein puts Baragon into an airplane spin. The first time I saw Frankenstein Conquers the World in color and widescreen was on a big screen TV back in 1998. Even though I'd seen it once before as a kid on a small black and white set, I finally got a chance to view it as it was meant to be viewed. And there's this scene where Feral Frankenstein Kid is at the Institute and they have him in front of the television tuned to some rock and roll show. And the kid's getting into it, right? Now, I'm watching this and this thought pops into my head. Are they taking a poke at Keith Richards? Okay, this movie was made in 1965 and in 1965 Keith Richards was still a fresh face on the music scene. He wouldn't be looking rugged like this character for about another 10 years. Maybe because the hair looks similar, I don't know. But I soon decided, aw, I'm just imagining things. Then somebody on the TV screams, and Feral Frankenstein Kid freaks and gets up, grabs the TV, and tosses it out the window. Let's make sure there ain't nobody here. Come a little bit this way so we make sure we get started here. That's it, right? Alright. Okay, you can tell us when. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Now. <laughs> I'm just saying. 